There is great hope. To begin this module, think about a newborn baby. Adorable. Beautiful in all the ways only a wrinkled lump can be beautiful. Think about what a newborn baby brings into the story of a family. They bring hopes and dreams and an identity and a destiny. And practically speaking, for more than just a few months, instead of offering the family any practical assets, they bring a lump of needs. Babies would not survive if they lived in a if you do this, I'll do that economy. Babies can't do much independently. Instead, the best thing that can happen when a newborn baby arrives in a family is trust. Trust me, baby, it's time to eat. Trust me, baby, it's time to sleep. Trust me, baby, I know that's a big mess. I'm going to help you. Trust is the best thing because when you feed the baby, she actually eats. When you put him to bed, he actually sleeps. When there's a big mess, she realizes it doesn't last forever and help is a great idea. When he pees on you while you're cleaning up the big mess, he realizes his behavior doesn't disqualify him from your help, and that's wonderful. This trusting and connecting way of relating with each other is great. The baby gets what he or she needs and grows up. Think about all the maturity that happens between the day a little precious lump comes into the world and their first birthday. And think about all of the things that baby can do as a one-year-old that she couldn't do the day she was born. Babies don't learn much in their first 12 months of life because we have a curriculum and a scope and sequence for them. We don't offer them lessons on holding up their head and sitting up and crawling and making sounds. Babies learn so much in the first year because they trust and we love and they are wired to grow up and growing up is noticeable when they hold up their head and sit up and crawl and start making sounds and words. They trust and we encourage and help. Everyone gathers around when they first learn to roll over, big cheers erupt, video cameras come out, love offers affirmation and celebration. We didn't put rolling over on a sticker chart and expect them to perform the maneuver morning, noon, and night. Babies are wired to roll over. It's part of growing and being alive. Trust is the best thing for newborns and one-year-olds and two-year-olds and for us too. Something strange happens around the toddler-child stage. Instead of trust being the goal of the day, we change it to perform. Instead of trust and connect, we begin to push independence. We begin to call part of life chores and put the idea that work is something to check off a list so we have time to play into our understanding of living. Instead of treating making up a bed like rolling over, instead of treating getting dressed and ready in the morning like it's a part of growing up and being alive, we begin to pay our children with stickers and screen time and even money. We've stopped aiming at trust and follow me and started aiming at please me or perform these tasks. And real trouble begins. Often it gets worse because we also name the trouble, the terrible twos and three natures. Naming them things makes them official it's a weird way of name calling and offering masks to our children. And our brains begin to live out of an invalid identity based on behavior instead of relationship. The names encourage us to think there's something uniquely wrong with me and we act like it. I'm a terrible too. Everyone expects me to be awful. So I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm officially a teenager. And that means everyone expects me to act as awful as my hormones make me feel. So here goes. Babies act like babies. And when trust is a part of a relationship, babies slowly but surely learn how to regulate their emotions and follow the leader. 
The calm pulse of the mom leads the agitated pulse of the little one to settle down. The gentle pacing of a father invites a cuddled infant to rest instead of fret. The parent keeps reminding the baby they are deeply loved, and the young one begins to act like it. When perform and please replace trust and follow, struggle invites shame to the party, and all hell breaks loose. Terrible twos act like terrible twos. Then we start grabbing for control and begin to offer behavior management instead of help. The stress of not earning all my stickers or trying to earn more than my brother offers an unhealthy dose of cortisol, which temporarily turns my brain off and I'm less capable than I was before. As a public school administrator for 10 years, I made literally thousands of sticker charts and behavior management systems. And the children that needed them most kept needing them just with bigger prizes and more external motivation. The children that complied for prizes were pleasers. They learned to perform the required skill, but their maturity was stunted. If we look again at the maturity that happens in the first 12 months of life and try to find another 12 months of life that bears the fruit of that kind of amazing maturity, we can't find it not in any other season of life. Why not? Love is the fuel of maturity and trust is required to receive love. I'm going to say that in a different way. Oxytocin is the hormone of maturity and trust is the valve that opens to let it flow. If we don't get oxytocin, we may function, but we won't grow up in the ways of maturity. We'll survive, but we won't thrive. Dopamine is a different hormone, meant for our good. It gives us a rush when we check something off our to-do list. Dopamine is designed to be taken on a full stomach of oxytocin, the love hormone. We get a dopamine hit for just getting something done, whether we connect in relationship or not. But that's not taking dopamine on an empty stomach. And the side effect we get is addicted to the prize, not the relationship. So children get addicted to stickers and screen time and prizes for performing. There's one other hormone important in this maturity story. Any fear children experience from the stress of having to perform or from the, or from the shame that comes with comparing the performance of one child to another, that fear comes with a cortisol drip. Cortisol is the fear hormone. It's meant for our good too, but we're not meant to live with a daily supply. Cortisol is the stuff that gives us the energy to run away from danger or fight it off. To give us that energy, some body systems have to get shut down. One system that gets turned off when we live in fear is our immune system. Another shutdown happens in all things associated with growing. Neuroscientists offer evidence that cortisol contributes to ADD and ADHD, learning disabilities, anxiety, depression, and panic disorders, and ultimately physical illness. We can have energy to fight and run away from cortisol or we can have fuel to grow up and mature and live the life we were created to live from oxytocin. Cortisol and oxytocin do not mix. We can't experience both at the same time. That's a scientific fact well documented by neuroscientists, including Dr. Carolyn Leaf. And the good news is oxytocin is the most powerful of the two. Love cancels the power of fear and restores the damage done by cortisol and hijacked dopamine. We all thrive when we have access to love. Our children mature when they have access to love, when there is someone they trust that helps them and meets their needs. We know this is true because we've watched it happen in the lives of babies. So we know what to do as our children get older. We know what to do in our own relationships. We need trusting relationships that help us 
and meet our needs. Let's lay these ideas next to a practical application. Consider a day in the life of a two-year-old, or a seven-year-old, or a 12, or 14, or any age young person. Life is a conflict of desires and agendas from the moment any of us wake up. This conflict doesn't fit well into a day planner that sets the objective for the day as be good. They can't. So the struggle escalates and becomes a battle of wills and a war of boundaries. What if we changed the objective for the day? Instead of be good, what if the objective was connect and reconnect? Our children can connect with us and others who will help if they trust us. It's vital that we never make be good as a way for children to connect with us. That's a blueprint for a life of abusive and manipulative relationships. Rather, let's recognize that when they connect with us, they are actually capable of goodness because we are lending them strength. Trust and obedience go together because trust is connection. And when we do this together, our children learn, grow up, and get things right. So instead of aiming at the target of your child being good, what about aiming at the target of connecting in relationship in a way that your child lets others help them and connecting in relationships in a way that your child helps others? Concentrating on trying to get a hundred average on their behavior today stresses children out and encourages them to hide and fight and rarely gives them opportunities to love or experience being loved. Instead, when we help children concentrate on staying connected to give and receive the help that love offers, we realize our children are growing up and because they're growing up, they are getting more things right. They're actually being good, not because that was the objective, but because it's how we're created to grow and live. And the bonus is maturity. And that never comes with performance alone. Your downloadable resources include a short selection of one of Dr. Leaf's books and an ebook to read to your children or your grandchildren and even to yourself. Enjoy your lingering.